Um, Freddie is going to uh, speak to us uh, this evening, and we will have the opportunity to ask him questions. Um, that goes for those people who are here and those people who are online as well. Um, so please don't be shy with your questions. Uh, you're welcome to put them in the chat if you're doing that online, uh, but also you'll be able to unmute yourself to be able to speak your questions as well at some point in time. Freddie. Thank you. I speak for those who cannot speak anymore. The Nazis' attempt to end every last Jew, man, woman and child, was about more than murder. It was also about dehumanizing the victims, both before and after death. The aim, it appears, was to have them known before they knew no more that they were unwanted by the world. As well as being extinguished, excised from the world, they were first made to believe that they were lesser creatures, an, un an affront to life itself. Untermenschen, they called it. Base human beings, less than human. Everything about the death camps was designed to break the human spirit, to scour people out until nothing was left but skins, easier to throw in the ovens. There were a few who survived, but that person must first want to survive in order to tell the story and bear witness. To survive, the victims had to force themselves to keep to any form of civilization. They were slaves, deprived of every right, exposed to every insult, condemned to almost certain death. I speak for those who cannot speak anymore. I was born in Vienna in 1930 to uh, lower middle class people. My father was a salesman and I was a happy child until the 12th of March 1938 when the first thing I knew what was happening was when the headmaster came into the class and told all the Jewish boys to get out and not come back to school. Neighbours started to disappear. Friends that I'd had for years wouldn't talk to me. There were restrictions in Vienna. Things got worse, gradually worse. I saw elderly people on their knees on the pavement. There was a shopkeeper, an orthodox man, a liberal, a mother and uh, her daughter with a crowd around them, screaming at them, spitting and abusing them. It was difficult to go out. We had to wear a yellow staff on our clothing. And the restrictions got worse as the days and weeks got on. You were not allowed to go on a tram, so you had to walk everywhere. You weren't allowed to go into the park, sit on a bench, go to the opera or the theatre. When all this happened, my father decided he would go to Zurich to get a, try and get a visa for my mother and for me. My mother couldn't understand that. She cried her eyes out. She said, how can you swan off to, to Zurich and leave me and your son with all that's happening here? My father, being very determined, said, it's the only way I know I can get you and Freddie out. And off he went. Several of my family were sent to Dachau. Now, Dachau was not a, a, a death camp. It was a holding camp. They went on from there to Theresienstadt and other killing areas. But it was always difficult. As I said, people were disappearing, were picked up in the street and taken in the back of a van. 
One day, I was with my mother, and we went to our local deli. Now, it's a deli, typical Jewish man behind the counter. Now, in those days, there wasn't self-service as we know it today. There was a counter, and in front of the counter was sacks. Sacks of rice, sacks of chickpea, barrels, barrels of cucumber, barrels of herring. This is how people were served in those days. With a fork and so on, not pre-packed as we know it today. And this Jewish owner was dispensing his humour as he usually did when two SS men came in and ordered him to close the shop. Now, he complained because he said, look, I've got customers, they need serving, I can't do that. He's, they insisted that, it, that he close the shop. Well, he got a little bit anxious and he sort of went right up to one of the SS men pleading with them. The other man took his revolver out and shot him in front of all the people who were there, including me. It was not a nice experience. My great memory of those times is fear, abject fear, fear you cannot believe that you have. I'll give you an example. If a doorbell rings now, I have no problem with that. If somebody knocks on the door like that, sends shivers of fear down me, because that was the sound you heard when the Nazis were coming. Within a fortnight, a Nazi came to our flat and ordered us to leave. We had two weeks to get out. It was needed for an Aryan family. That's what we were told. And... Uh, <laughs> We had nowhere to go other than my grandparents. Now, my grandparents lived in a small flat and had an unmarried daughter still living with them. And we stayed with them until my father went off to Zurich. Can I tell the story about my father, which is not really me? My father got to the border of Bregenz, which borders Austria and Switzerland. And on that day, the border was closed. So my father was walking along the shoreline, wondering what to do. When he was approached by a civilian who asked him, asked my father for his name and his papers. And my father said, who wants to know? And the fellow turned it over his lapel. He was the gauleiter of the area. And he said to my father, what are you doing here? So my father said, I want to go to Switzerland. He said, the borders are closed. You must go back to Vienna, where you came from, and uh, there's no place for you here. Well, it was already late evening, and my father stayed the night, and he was concerned what to do. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, he went to Gestapo headquarters and asked for the Gauleiter to see the Gauleiter. He was told that the Gauleiter was away until six o'clock that evening. My father said, I'll stay here until then. He waited all day for this Gauleiter. And when he eventually came, the Gauleiter said to him, what on earth are you doing here? I told you to go back to Vienna. My father said, I want to speak with you. So the guy lighter called him into the office and my father said, look, you want to get rid of Jews. I want to go out. What, where's the problem? Let me go out. So this guy lighter said, OK, there's a train to Zurich tonight at 8 o'clock. I want you to be at the station just outside the barrier. I will be there. And when I tell you, to go, I will give you a signal like that, and that's when you have to go onto the train. My father was there before eight o'clock waiting. The gauleiter came there. The, 
chef du train blew his whistle and the, slowly started to go. The Gauleiter motioned to my father. My father ran onto the train and got to Zurich. There he wrote to England to apply for a visa for my mother and I. Um, in, on the 8th of November, I mean, we had all sorts of problems uh, living during that time. But on the 8th of November, a diplomat went into the German embassy in Paris and shot the diplomat. Hitler ordered an uprising against the Jews in Vienna and ordered the police not to interfere. They smashed all the Jewish-owned shop windows. They smashed all the windows of the people who lived on the first floor. They broke into the synagogue. They absolutely smashed it. Not only in Vienna, it was all over Austria. They took the Sefer Torahs out, burnt them. All the holy books they burnt. And it was a terrible, terrible night. 238 people committed suicide that night. It was a nightmare. In the morning, when the sun rose, all the broken glass that was on the streets and on the pavement glistened like crystals. And hence, it became known as Kristallnacht, the night of the crystals, for that very reason. We had to go, my mother and I, into all sorts of emigration places for finance, for the civic duties. And we had to sign a document that we would willingly leave behind all that we owned. That's We had to sign that. And then we got on the train with a visa to go to Zurich. My mother got the visa, provided she went into domestic service and she came to England. When we got on the train and the train went off, as an eight-year-old, I thought we were already in safe hands. We were on our way out but we were, of course, still in Austria. And I was a chatterbox. I said all sorts of things I shouldn't have been saying to my mother. And sitting opposite us was a gentleman who eventually turned his lapel over. He was also a Nazi supporter, and he asked my mother to come out of the carriage, and he took me into the toilet and gave me a strip search, which again sent the fear of God into me. You can imagine, as an eight-year-old, you don't know what's happening or even really the reason why. As I said, fear was the great thing. Well, my father got a job in Zurich. He also had a small place for us to stay. And we spent several happy w weeks in Zurich. Zurich was a lovely city. I don't know if any of you know it. It's a peaceful ci city on the edge of a lake, and we were very happy there. We were quite happy to stay. We had a, v a visa to stay 24 hours in Zurich, my mother and I, but we loved it so much we wanted to stay. Until one day on a Saturday morning, knock on the door, two Swiss police came and said to us, if my mother and I didn't leave the Switzerland within 24 hours, we would be sent back to the Austria. So that was how the Swiss behaved. It was, in fact, the Swiss authorities who asked the Austrians and the Germans to put a J on the passport so that they 
would know a Jew from a non-Jew. Well, we got on a train. Of course, trains were much slower in those days. It took nearly two days to go to Calais. And then the crossing from Calais to Dover, a very rough crossing. It was in December. We arrived in England on the 20th of December, 1938. After a very rough crossing, I was sick as a dog on board. But there we are, we were free. So within a few days, immediately after Christmas, my mother had to go into domestic service. Not a nice job. I mean, my mother was a fine needlewoman. And she suddenly had to lay fires at six in the morning, uh, empty night pots and doing all sorts of cleaning she was never used to. The Jewish Board of Guardians decided to foster me out to non-Jewish families uh, and to make sure that I didn't get too emotionally involved. They moved me every three months. So every three months, I had a new family. So in two years, I had eight different families. To me, as an eight-year-old, that's how life was. What was to me far more worrying was the vast majority of the people I was with said, this fellow doesn't speak any English. There's no point in sending him to school. So I missed one year of school in, in Vienna, and two years of schooling here. In the meantime, my father came to England in August of 1939, joined the British Army, was sent to France with the British Expeditionary Force, was injured in France, came home on a hospital ship, was in hospital in Haverford West for nine months, was honorably discharged for his wounds, and immediately became an enemy alien. <laughs> having, fought from the, having fought from Britain, the only thing that was in his favour, he was not being sent to the Isle of Man. He was discharged in Taunton, and it was the first time that my mother and I and my father were together since we left Zurich. This was 1942. And my father, coming from a city of culture and music like Vienna, found Taunton, where he was uh, dismissed. <laughs> it's a county town in the midst of the war, was a dead and alive place. My father said, I can't live here. I'm going back to London. So he went back to London to find a job and a home for us. And we followed him in London. It was already during the Blitz. And we, in 1944, had a doodlebug fall in our front garden, which made a bit of a mess of our place. It wasn't our place. We were renting it. Uh, and the fire brigade dug me out. And I was very happy to be there. But I was in Taunton, before we came to London, I was sent to a convent school. Now, there were, only, there, there were nuns as teachers. All I can tell you, they were the most kindest of people that you can imagine. And they taught me enough English in three months to go to a grammar school in Taunton. So when it came to coming to London, I went from a grammar school in Taunton to a grammar school in London, which happened to be Holloway County Grammar. It doesn't exist anymore, but that was a lovely grammar school, and I enjoyed my time there. Um, I did nine O-levels and four A-levels at that school. Um, you had to do four A-levels in those days. You had no choice. And it was either sciences or it was the arts, English, history, geography on one side, or chemistry, physics, applied and pure maths on the other. Well, I chose science. 
And as I said, I got four A-levels, and I wanted to go to university. But before going to university, there was such a thing called the deferment board, who decided whether you would go to university before or after national service. There was 18 months national service that all 18-year-olds had to go to. So the board asked me what it is I wanted to do. And so I said, look, with my A-levels, I'm civil engineering seemed the obvious choice. And I'd love to go to King's College in London. So they huddled together. And they said to me, we'll guarantee you a place at King's but you have to do national service first. It depended on many things. It depended on which university, which discipline were you choosing, how good were your A-level results. It, a whole mixture of things depended on whether you went first to university or after your national service. So they said, you will do your national service first. You will be called up in February of 1950. You will have 18 months national service. You will be out in uh, October. You will be out in, yeah, it was February. You will be out in October ready for the semester. Halfway through my national Halfway through the National Service, the Korean War started. And my 18 months National Service became two years. So I finished up coming out of the RAF in February of 1952, having to wait eight months for the start of the semester. And of course, I had to work. My parents couldn't keep me. I had been away from books for two and a half years and I had totally lost the discipline of reading. Totally lost it. I could no longer concentrate. So I decided I would go into the Thai business. Thais were very colourful in those days and that's what attracted me to go into the Thai business. But you know, I didn't go to university, but I had one great event that, as far as I was concerned, was better than anything I could have done at university. I met this wonderful lady called Vanda, and we courted, and I married her, and we were happily married for 63 happy years, and to me that was worth far more than anything that I could have had as a degree. Coming back out of the services, I had always done charity work. And we moved, Vander and I, to Northward. And we found friends who decided we wanted to establish a Jewish retirement home in Northward. Well, we soon found that prices in Northwood were far more than we could have possibly afford. And we went to Bushy, which in those days was a much more reasonable price. And we bought out, well, we formed a committee. I was at that stage uh, a treasurer, and I managed to raise £1.3 million to buy this home for the elderly and we bought a, 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 a um, it was a um, hmm. it was a home for the elderly run by people that weren't really that nice and the house was an eight-bedroomed house. We kept the facade, 
but we had a, a, a Jewish um, manager, not, not just manager, the, the, he was an architect to completely redesign the, the place. There were 19 people who lived in that place. How they got in there in that small, I, I don't know. They must have shared rooms and so on. We decided we would make a proper 10-bedroomed home, fully functional with all the facilities that Jewish people would want. And our chairman opened the house in 19, in 2002. And we had 10 elderly people as residents. Well, our chairman moved away from London and I took over as chairman and I was chairman there for 12 years. And then I became as old as the residents and decided it was time for me to go. And I decided I'd had enough and I'd retire. Um, I've been lucky all of my life. I married the most wonderful, wonderful lady. We had 60 wonderful years together. We have three beautiful daughters, six super grandchildren and three gorgeous great grandchildren. I truly have been very, very lucky. And I'm only going to finish on a slightly different note, not from about me, but about conditions. Under the brutality of the Nazi regime, millions of people knew that their fate was never secure. They lived each day in a permanent state of fear, knowing it might bring a forced eviction, a deportation to a concentration camp, or the flick of a finger that could be the difference between life and death. Each day was a continuous nightmare, one from which the horrendous figure of six million men, women, would never awaken, including just over a million children. The lessons of the Holocaust must form the cultural code for education towards human rights, democracy, tolerance, and opposition to racism. This will enable us one day to live in a more peaceful and tolerant world. I have a mantra. I've always had a mantra. Forgive, but never forget. Forgive, not necessarily because they deserve forgiveness, but you deserve peace. Hatred is self-destructive. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Freddie, thank you so much for talking with us this afternoon and giving us insight into your life. Um, I'm sure that people will have uh, many questions uh, that uh, they would like to ask you, and we do have time for them, which is really wonderful. Uh, you've been a brilliant speaker <laughs> because you've allowed everybody to express themselves and their thoughts as well and ask the questions. Um, uh, Freddie, I got to know you um, through Abbeyfield yes. um, when Freddie uh, showed a number of the uh, character traits uh, which I think have stood you well. Um, you have um, survived many things, actually, haven't you? Including two civil wars while I was travelling abroad. I was in the midst of two civil wars. One was... They're both shooting wars. One was Biafra... If you remember, it was a province of Nigeria and they wanted to secede from Nigeria and the Nigerians came in with guns blazing. I was very lucky. I had a local African uh, agent working with me 
and I got out at the back of his car in the well of the car with a blanket over me. I managed to get out of that one. The other one, the other civil war, was in Beirut when the Palestinians tried to take over uh, Lebanon. And I managed to get out of that by the skin of my teeth. So the, these are just a additional things. This, it, it reminds me a little bit of um, uh, it, at, in our Haggadah. It would have been enough. Yes. I, I, survived, I survived the Holocaust. I survived the Blitz. Uh, you had a, um, a, what did you call it in your front garden? A bug? A um, doodle bug. A, a v, V1. Oodlebug, my goodness gracious me, um, quite quite phenomenal. Um, I think though the the, the tra character traits that I uh, observed in you at Abbeyfield, uh, one was absolutely tenacity, um, not taking no for an answer, um, and a number of times I was like, "Is this really my rabbinic role?" Today? No, you reassured me, you educated me in my rabbinic duties, um, uh, but the other was that you did it with such gentleness such gentleness and uh, it was uh, in a way I couldn't say no to you <laughs> and the way that you uh, were with all of the residents was just wonderful to behold um, so it was a real personal treat to be with you thank you and, thank you. and also um, I have to say uh, Freddie mentioned Vandra a number of times and I have to say um, the two if you looked at a couple who were in love these two people were in love and it was a real privilege to Thank see you. the two of you to, together. Um, questions, please, um, from um, uh, the floor here, and uh, then we'll come to uh, others who want to as well. Peter. Please. Uh, you uh, described your fear as a child of Vienna very well. At what point were you aware uh, of the um. wider atrocities going on um, in, in Austria and in Europe? Freddie, can I just repeat the question so that everybody at home can yeah, because we can't yeah, yeah, hear I, it I, on I, I realised that halfway through. And, and one drop ball. Um, <laughs> so the question was uh, uh, um, that Freddie had described uh, the fear of himself uh, that he directly experienced. But uh, the question is really about uh, awareness during that period of time of what else was going on in Europe, I think. The Austrian population was never informed, in fact, were kept secret of what was happening in Germany since 1933. So the Jewish population, until the Nazis actually came into Vienna, never knew of the brutality of what was happening. And being at school, from don't forget it, in, on the continent you go to school at six, not at five as it is here, I knew nothing of what was happening in the wider world. And so the shock was that much greater for the Jewish population of Vienna, because it was all of a sudden, overnight, as they marched in, Nazi flags were flying from all the public buildings. All the police had Nazi armbands. Overnight, they knew what was happening, but the Jewish population didn't. Do you have a follow-up, Peter? Yes, but that, that's very much a sort of overall mm. view. I want, if, if you can, remember what you personally, as an eight-year-old child, or maybe it wasn't until you got to Britain that you heard about what was happening more widely. Didn't really find out what was happening. Sorry, do you think extent. you could hear the question? Yeah, I apologise. Leah, don't worry. It's, it was a very obvious one. It's OK. Freddie's going to take it on. Until the relief of Belson by the British Army, people in Britain didn't know what was happening either. Parts of the government knew what was happening. They were encouraged to bomb these camps. But Churchill said... We need the bombs for more materialistic, for, for, the, for the armed services. And they never did actually bomb any of the... Although there were certain uprisings in one or two of the death camps. 
Yes. Oh. Have you got a question? Because we've got, they can't hear you online. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, have you, do you work with other survivors um, in terms of education, etc.? Yes. So I belong to the Holocaust Educational Trust, who sponsors people like me. There must be at least 15 and 20 other people who go to different, we used to go to schools to talk. Uh, I went to the girls' school in Northwood to give a talk. But then when COVID came in, it was all on Zoom. And from up till now, quite recently, I've been giving talks on Zoom. And so did all the others. And this is how we do. But we talk to students who are um, Year 10, I once was asked by my rabbi to talk to children who were 10 years old, 9 to 10. And I was talking about the 3 million Jews that, and a hand shot up from the class and said, please, sir, what is 3 million? And I realized that I'd been talking to older children and adults and not to younger children. And I stopped talking to the youngsters because a lot of it they couldn't understand. Mm. It is now, Holocaust is now part of the school curriculum. But it's one thing reading the facts like the Napoleonic Wars or whatever. It's another when somebody can get up and say, I was there, I saw what happened, mm. and it has a deeper meaning and an impact yeah. to the children. Yeah. Come, Peter. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, how do you think that helped you later in life? So the question is about uh, when Freddie wasn't able to go to school, how he occupied himself and what might have been some of the tools and abilities that he learned during that period of time that may have helped him the longer term. I was totally unsupervised. <laughs> Apart from being taken to this family and collected to begin to be taken to another family. I was totally unsupervised. And I wandered around the streets as an eight-year-old doing things I shouldn't have been doing, mm. getting into all sorts of little troubles. I was an eight-year-old. I wasn't a goody-goody. You know, I pinched things. I ran on people's doorbells. I did all the things that naughty children did do, and I suppose still do. And has it helped me in any way? It made me more independent. That's the way it helped me. And when I was, I became an exporter. I exported British made goods all over the world. It had to have a label made in England. And that's what sold it. Today, we don't make anything anymore. <laughs> but it did teach me independence and how to look after myself. That's the one thing it did teach me. Thank you so much indeed. And uh, Leah, I don't know if you've got people who might like to ask some questions. Yes, of course. At the moment, at the moment on Zoom, we've mostly had people thanking Freddie um, 
for sharing his story. So Pip and Melissa and Marsha and Paul and Linda all commented about um, what a privilege it is to be able to hear your story. So thank you. I, I might, uh, if I might ask myself a, a question. There, there was a, a fact that uh, you mentioned, which I wasn't so aware of, which was um, um, one of the consequences of uh, Kristallnacht, I believe, was the 238 suicides. Yes. Which, is that in Vienna or? That was, was just in Vienna. Just in Vienna. And uh, so that was obviously, I mean, I've never heard that before. So it sounded like something which uh, we, you might like to say, if you can, just a little bit more uh, about that night, because I think you already spoke very beautifully about it and very poignantly, mm -hmm. but you might want to say a bit more. Well, I, I don't see, I don't say things like that when I'm talking to school. Yeah. Yeah. Here is a different story. No. I'm talking to adults. I, I can talk about these yeah. horrid things, but uh, I, I don't go into great detail. No. But I was just wondering what some of the um, uh, the feelings of people. Obviously, there was this deep, deep fear which you expressed Absolute. in yourself, and obviously within adults as well. But that was a really interesting piece, I mean, a horrific, but interesting piece that there were so many suicides on that evening as well. Was that the feeling of foreboding or...? The noise, the damage that the population of Vienna did on that night. They smashed, not just windows, they smashed into shops, they broke into the... There was one big um, store, several storage high, owned by four Jewish brothers. They smashed the door in, they smashed the place to pieces. They took things out just t to take things. It really was a terribly noisy evening. And with this what was going on and this terrible noise, I'm not surprised that some people decided to take their lives. Mm. Thank you. I, I, just that's is something which we don't often consider, just hearing the word noise. You know, very often when you read in a book or whatever, but that's, thank you very much indeed. I think that's really quite a, an insight. Dad. So we've got a two-part yeah. question. The yeah. uh, first one is why the Galleiter uh, let Freddie's dad onto the train. A Galleiter is a person in charge of a local area, a, mm. a Nazi. Mm. And so the question was why you feel that he actually let his dad, uh, let your dad onto the train, whether it was because it, it was his chutzpah or what do you think it was? A miracle. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only way I can put it. Yeah. It's the way that my father survived. It's the way that's why I'm here. Without this Gauleiter letting my father go and helping him to get on a train, my mother and I would never have made it. Mm. Yeah, those little things which just... Yeah, absolutely. Cannot explain it. Yeah. And, um, and the second... Howard, Howard had a question um, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come back to Dad's other one. Yeah, go on. Um, uh, so Howard's question was, is, um, he says he's sorry to ask this, but can you see shadows of the 1930s today with I Russia and Ukraine? That. Yeah. Uh, so the Howard, who's in York, uh, is asking whether you can see shadows of um, the Holocaust with what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you the, the picture that was in my mind when I saw the... Mothers and children getting on a train. Mm. That brought back the memories because that's exactly what happened to my mother and I. Yes, not just shadows, reality. Yeah. Thank you, Freddie. Um, so, uh, Brian? Um, Freddie and I have known each other for quite some time. Um, and that's through Happy for You and Jeff. 
Belmont Lodge, yeah. yeah. Brian was just expressing, as uh, those many people have uh, in the chat, um, his appreciation and his thanks, uh, but in a very beautiful way in having known uh, Freddie through Belmont Abbeyfield and the beautiful, as, as you expressed, calm, gentle, wonderful way. And Brian expressed as well, just he didn't know uh, that there was a backstory. Uh, didn't understand that. Yeah. A little story, if I may, Please. about Belmont Lodge. <laughs> um, we had nine ladies and one gentleman. And two of the ladies one day got into a, a bit of a tiff. They never did that, did they? They did. I know, oh, they, they did yes, on a regular basis, I can tell you that. And so. it got worse <laughs> and worse and they wouldn't talk to one another, and it, they started shouting at one another, I wouldn't have that. I called them into the office, and I said to each one separately, nobody told you when you came into the home that you had to love everybody. But one thing I demand from you is that you respect them. If you cannot respect the people who live here, you have no place in this home. I said that to the, both of them separately. They became the best of friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible. And we've got a we question. We have one more question on, online, if, if we yeah, may. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, so Melissa Oliver is asking, do you think the Holocaust influenced your faith, Freddie, and if so, how? Yeah, so uh, Melissa is asking uh, whether the Holocaust and your experience of it influenced your faith. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> the answer to that simple is no, but it needs explaining. <laughs> <clears throat> My parents lost a daughter to diphtheria when she was six years old. I was two at the time and I never knew her. And my parents said, if that's what God can do, I don't want to know him. I understood, I didn't agree with it, but I understood my parents. And so in Vienna, I never knew about Shabbat. I never knew about Rosh Hashanah, Pesach, or Yom Kippur. I was totally ignorant, other than the fact that I knew I was a Jew, I knew nothing more. I came to England. I was um, sent from pillar to post, as you know, without any Jewish education. I was in the RAF, and by a very strange coincidence, there came a note one day to say that there would be a Jewish meeting for Jewish servicemen at, um, what was that lovely club called in, in Hampstead, West Hampstead? Maccabi. All right. There would be, and our, my parents' home was a hundred yards from where the Maccabi was. So I said, oh, that's easy. I'll, I'm going to take that. So, of course, I lived with my parents, but I went every day to Maccabi. And there was a rabbi there who, on a one-to-one -one basis, gave me faith. He taught me more about the background of Judaism than I've ever knew before. And I got my faith 
through him. I still say religion has a lot to answer for in this world. But faith is something that's deep inside you. And that's something I have plenty of. So that's... That's wonderful to hear. Thank you very much indeed. We do have another question. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Well, Margaret. The question is about forgiveness. Yes. Yeah. And what, what is it? That, you, that it's, said that it's a tough, Yeah. The question was: that it's such a tough thing to be able to give. It's not an easy thing to be able to forgive. Is the questioner is asking? Well, the longer time goes on, the easier it is to forgive, of course. <laughs> So the question is, what would you tell younger people? Because as a 92-year-old, you may be able to forgive, but yeah. <laughs> I explained that the opposite of forgiveness is hatred. And hatred is something that destroys you. It completely ex 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 takes you over. So it is far better to forgive even though they may not deserve the forgiveness. But forgive and it cleanses your mind and your spirit and your heart. So it's a good pragmatic approach. It's a good pragmatic approach. Yes, Yeah. absolutely. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, Paul, and then we'll come back to Dad's if we've no other... Anti-Semitism had been rife in Austria for a thousand years. For a thousand years, the Catholic Church taught the people every week that the Jews killed Christ. And that, over the centuries, became part and parcel of the Austrian... They called it Wiener Blut, the Viennese blood. It came right inside them. And as for a thousand years, they had this hatred. And it was always evident. So did your parents feel this in a personal capacity in terms of did they have non-Jewish friends? Or did they suffer um, verbal attacks or any sort of other attack from, uh, because of anti-Semitism? Prior to the Germans marching in, 50% of all the doctors in Vienna were Jewish. Jewish judges, Jewish in the civil service. Uh, there was an underlying anti-Semitism, but nothing overt. It's only once the Germans marched in that it suddenly became not only overt, but so strong. Mm. It, it released something inside that they needed releasing. Sorry, can I follow up with another question? Say, um, at what age did you start talking about your experiences? In the, <laughs> the question is about what age Freddie started. Yes, yes, speaking I did hear that. Um, Sorry, I'm thinking about this because it's it's. Um, I think around 1968 when we moved to Northwood, and I became aware of more Jewish people in Northwood. Then I decided I need to do. I'd been working for charity, Jewish charities, all my life since I was 18. 
I belonged to the Jewish Sportsman's Committee, which was a well-known Jewish uh, charity in uh, 1948 and going back that long. Um, but I decided when I came to Northwood that I needed to do something more than just know about it. I needed to tell other people about it and I started making inquiries both to the shul and to the orthodox shul when it became part of Ealing, became part of Northwood, I mean. Uh, I was in Leeding for 19 years and it never occurred to me at that stage to talk about it. Freddie, thank you so, so very, very much for speaking with us today. I don't know if you're aware, but you have spoken so beautifully and eloquently with us and allowed us plenty of time to ask you questions, to be able to elaborate a little bit and to understand more ourselves um, we really do appreciate that opportunity so thank you so very very much indeed um, and mum you can find over there just a couple of bundles of things in black brown paper um, uh, to be able to uh, thank you appropriately as well um, that is totally unnecessary uh, of course I it's totally unnecessary you, but um, <laughs> it's totally unnecessary but do you know what? Everybody deserves to have a beautiful scent. And uh, you have given us a, um, a, the opportunity to meet a beautiful man. And it's just quite right for us to be able to, uh, in a very, sh very small way, just to be able to thank you and to hope that you have... It's very kind. Lo they're you lovely. Oh, they're gorgeous. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. And that's lovely. Thank you. So t two things, uh, finally. Um, I'd just ask you if you're able to rise. Uh, we will recite El Male Rachamim. Of course. In honor of our six million who were murdered in the Holocaust. El Male Rachamim Shochem Bam Romim. Hamsem Nuchan Ochana Tachat Kanfe Hashkina. Im Kudoshim with Chorim, Kuzoha Harakia Maskirim. Et nishmot river vot al fei Yisrael shemei tu al kiddush Hashem baal harachamim hasti rain besete knafecha lo alamim withro bitro hachaim et nishmotam Adonai hu nechalatam v'yano hu vashalom hamishkavam v'nomam amen God full of compassion exalted God. Grant perfect rest under the wings of your presence, among the holy and pure who shine as the brightness of the firmament, to the souls of the millions of our people who died for the sanctification of your name. Merciful God, shelter them forever under your wings and let their souls be bound up in the bond of eternal life. May they find their destiny in your nearness and may they rest in peace. Let us say. Amen. And finally, Freddie, at the front of our synagogue, kindly donated by members of our synagogue, is a memorial, a special garden, which is for Holocaust survivor speakers. Oh, yes. Because we have been privileged, despite the horrors that so many have experienced, to have had the privilege to know you and to hear your words, to hear fact, to understand ourselves, the horrors that went before, and to commit ourselves to do everything we can to prevent it happening to other people. For you, Adonai Oz Leamo Yitain, may the Eternal One Grant God's people with strength. Adonai Yivarech et Amo Shalom. And may God bless us with peace. Amen to that.